Good morning and good afternoon, listeners and viewers. Uh, thank you again for joining us today on our Thought Line series. Today, we're lucky enough to have Joanne Needleman, member of Clark Hill PLC, joining us. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, Joanne. Good afternoon, Boris. It's so great to be with you today. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, Joanne, uh, we've known each other for a little bit and obviously, um, We've had a lot of very interesting conversations in everything financial services. Uh, however, for our listeners and viewers who may not be as familiar with the work that you do, would you mind giving a little bit of an introduction uh, as well as a little bit of your background? Sure, thank you. Uh, and thank you for doing this. I think these types of podcasts are really important right now as we're all sitting at home trying to figure out how to move forward. So I appreciate that LiveOx is, is doing this. So hello to all your listeners. Um, if, you, if we have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Joanne Needleman, and I am a partner at the law firm at Clark Hill. I also lead our Consumer Financial Services Regulatory and Compliance Practice Group, which is all things consumer finance, uh, from compliance, um, internal processes, procedures, uh, as well as external compliance um, on behalf of federal and state regulations. I deal a lot with the CFPB. I am a former member of the Consumer, Consumer Advisory Board at the Bureau. Uh, I know a lot of people there and um, not many have left. They're the same core group is still there other than the director. Uh, but it is a pleasure to, in the last couple of years, to have been working with Livebox. And really, it's been a fabulous partnership in really understanding and uh, what, what the regulations are meant to do and how to um, adjust your products and services to ensure that they're used in a uh, compliant way. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you say uh, an important piece there in terms of a compliant way, and that's been sort of, if you will, a rabbit that's been constantly sort of shifting uh, and changing directions as lots of organizations have been trying to change that. And more specifically, I guess, maybe a question, uh, Joanne, to, uh, to you to start things off. Uh, given the fact that things have changed or things are changing recently, what should organizations look out for? Like what's next on the docket? Uh, what is everybody waiting for next to come out? I know there's been already a lot of changes, but what are the things and, and maybe the timelines for those uh, events that we should be looking out for today? I think it's a good question. And I think uh, certainly your clients in the collections industry and the financial services industry have always been looking to see what the CFPB is doing. And I think that's the that's the main regulator where all of us should be focused. And they have been really active. Um, in terms of what's relevant uh, to the folks listening on this webinar, obviously it is putting out final rules around debt collection. Uh, our industry, as you know, Boris, has been subject, really has been regulated for a long time, but we never have had any real codified rules. Um, rules of compliance have been formulated by guidance, uh, by enforcement mm -hmm. actions, and by case law. And that's really hard for businesses to wrap their hands around in trying to plan strategically for the future. Because you can invest in a path of what you think compliance is, and a new law comes out or the CFPB enforces a company, and that kind of blows up your plans. And it's been really difficult for this industry to set in motion a consistent compliance plan. It's always been like kind of whack-a-mole. I, right. I, I have something and then I change it. Well, for the last five, almost six years, the Bureau, well, let me back up a second. As we know, uh, most of your clients are governed by federal law and that is the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Back in 1977, under the Carter administration, when the FDCPA was enacted, there was a, a rift between Congress and then the FTC, who was the primary regulator. So there were no codified rules that govern the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which brings us to why we're in this mess today. But when Dodd-Frank was enacted and the CFPB was formed, many of the authorities that the FTC had were transferred over to the CFPB. And one of them was the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And the most important authority that the CFPB got was to write rules. And, uh, under the FDCPA. So what the Bureau has been doing for five years is been in the rulemaking process. 
that has involved lots of proceedings, lots of hearings, lots of engagements that ultimately, um, which resulted, I should say, back in May of 2019, of what is called a notice of proposed rule, which was mm -hmm. an end right. which for all of your clients saw it was a 500 page document, which really was about 44 pages of rules, but everything else was how they got to those conclusions. And so industry has been looking at that NPR really for the past year and figuring out, and it's been somewhat of a guessing game, you know, what should my infrastructure of my company look like in anticipation of a final rule? And I think right. that the NPR gives you an excellent guide to what the final rule is going to be. I don't think you're going to see real departures from what is being proposed in the NPR when the final rule comes out. And we suspect that the final rule, based on what the CFPB has said, is going to come out next month. Wow. Okay. Okay. So that that's that's 30 days out, uh, give or take. We should absolutely be looking out for that. So a dual question for you, Joanne, on, the, on this particular piece. Um, so for, first of all, for folks who are maybe not familiar with the proposed uh, proposed rules, at a fairly high level, uh, what do these rules either both propose and contain? Like, uh, what is the big what is the big sort of, if you will, theme of these rules? Okay, so the, I think the big theme of these rules is to get some consistency in areas where the debt collection industry has struggled with. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me let me highlight about three or four. The first has been the demand letter, the validation notice. We, mm -hmm. we have had such heartburn about what should the validation notice say. All we know is what's in the statute, but we have no idea of formatting. We have no idea uh, or certainly have no guidance if you added, wanted to add more information, less information. You know, something as simple as what is the balance that is owed? That has been an issue of litigation and uh, an oversight for, as I said, since 1977. So the one of the first things that the rule do, did, excuse me, was put out a form. Um, they call it a model form of what a validation notice should look like. That, in my opinion, you may not like it. Uh, you may not like everything it says. It may be difficult for some companies to develop that form, but if you can develop it in something substantially similar to what the CFPB has proposed, you get a safe harbor, meaning if you send out the letter, you know, and everything that, that the CFPB says should be in that letter, you will not be liable under the act. You should not be sued, or if you are, you know, being enforced or investigated, you have complied in the CFPB's mind with the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So that's extremely important. That's been an issue yeah. for many of your clients. I think the other big issue for your clients is that the CFPB has proposed a limitation on how many times a client, uh, a debt collector can contact a consumer as what we know is call caps. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is through this rulemaking process, the Bureau proposed six contacts per account per week once right party contact has been established. In the proposed rules, they up that up to seven. And so there's been a lot of debate back and forth, whether that's hurtful, helpful. Clearly, consumer advocates don't like the fact that you could call somebody one time per day per account. If somebody's got three accounts, that means they're getting called three times a day for a total of 21 calls in a week. Mm -hmm. um, but as we know, I mean, we, we there needs to be an element of contact and communication with consumers in order for, in order to communicate with them and help hopefully help them to resolve their debts. You need that open line of communication. So call caps is a very, very big issue. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one interesting aspect of the proposal, which I think is really helpful and is interesting in comparison to the call caps is the idea that the Bureau now is, is allowed, I shouldn't say allowing, but certainly, a, um, finding favor in alternative forms of communication, yep. being email and text. And Boris, as you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're in the call center technology business. For years, it's been about the telephone. That's right. But we also know moving forward, it's been less about the telephone and more about 
alternative forms of, of communicating with consumers. And more importantly, what we know and what Livebox knows is that's the way consumers want to be communicated. They want the text, they want the email. And I think the Bureau recognizes that. Now, the interesting thing about the proposals for email and text are, unlike telephone calls, there is no cap on the amount of times that you can contact a consumer using an email and text. However, you must comply and give consumers a right to opt out. Right. Communication, excuse me, that you have. Um, there's also, I don't want to get too deep because it gets complicated. As far as email goes, there are some requirements that the Bureau feels are necessary with regard to e-sign, especially if you're going to be sending documents. Um, so that will be involved with, uh, with email. There will be an issue of consent. Now, today, right now, if you wanted to email or text a consumer, let's put aside the ATDS that you're using certain technology. Let's just say, I, I want to email and text a consumer. I don't need consent to do that if I'm collecting the debt. Mm -hmm. When the FDC, when the final rules come out, you will have to get some consent and the rules spell out how you would do that. Um, and there's also some safe harbors that if you do get consent and in fact you have the wrong consumer, you will not be considered in violation of the rules because you relied on what you believed was the correct information for that consumer to contact them using email or text. But I think it opens up, you know, if, in, if the final rules do come out and, and as proposed, the idea of using alternative communications, in my opinion, and as we're seeing it now, will be extraordinarily helpful for the debt collection industry, not only to be able to use these technologies, but to have a framework of how to use them without having tremendous risk exposure. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's great commentary. And and I guess maybe to dig in a little bit about who should be or shouldn't be concerned about the proposed rules. Uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about the debt collection industry, uh, but certainly there's folks on the enterprise or on the direct to, cons uh, to consumer side from the standpoint of, of uh, fintech companies or uh, banks and credit unions predominantly them themselves. How, sh how concerned should they or should they not be around the proposed, the proposed rules here as far as it relates to consent or the process of collecting on, uh, on, on credit or delinquent accounts? I think they should be concerned. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I've talked with a lot of fintech companies in the last several mm -hmm. months. Uh, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurship going on right now. Uh, <laughs> with, with every disaster comes That's great right. opportunity. So a lot of people are talking about so many things right now. And, you know, let, let me just highlight fintechs for a second. So fintechs have just been such great disruptors of the financial services industry and, and thinking about things differently. Um, but I find sometimes with fintechs, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, that they tend to silo their focus on one particular aspect. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about financial services, Boris, as you know, it's a holistic system. You know, right. there's lending, there's, there's the mid-servicing, then there could be recovery, then there could be bankruptcy. So it's, it, it, they all interrelate, and you can't just focus on one aspect. And I know that's the beauty of what some fintechs do is that they drill down to one issue in the process that needs to be fixed or has a better solution. And that's great, but you have to look at the holistic process. So I find sometimes fintechs, especially in the lending space, you know, focused on lending, how do we get consumers? How do we lend the right way? Do all of that stuff. They forget about the back end. Mm. <laughs> and the back end is there still needs to be recovery. Right. Now, while the debt collection rules only apply to third party debt collectors, remember that whether you're a bank or you're a fintech company, sometimes you outsource your information, you know, you outsource your accounts to third parties to do that collection work. And that's fine. But you, by doing that, you still have to oversee them. You still mm -hmm. have to make sure that they're, they're complying with the laws and regulations, especially when it comes to, we'll call it default servicing, collection, whatever the case may be. So they have to, while the rules may not apply to them per se, they still have to be aware of them because they have to make sure their vendors are otherwise complying. So they should pay attention. There is also a small nuance in the rule, which we don't know how it's ultimately going to shake out until the final rule comes out. But there was a lot of commentary in the proposed rules from the CFPB 
that indicated that the CFPB was going to look at these proposals and if you did not otherwise comply with them. So if, if, so for example, say call cap. Mm -hmm. Call cap says you call seven times a day. Now, if you're a creditor and you call eight times, excuse me, in a week, the CFPB hinted that that could potentially be an unfair or deceptive act because under the FDCPA, it would be a violation of their rules. And so there's a lot of discussion of whether the CFPB is going to look at creditors who, while they may not otherwise be subject to the FDCPA, if they do, if, if their act or conduct would otherwise violate the FDCPA, they may view that as a UDAP. So that might be a backdoor way of pulling creditors um, into the proposed rules, or not even into the proposed rules, but setting a standard for which creditors and originators would have to comply with. Maybe they wouldn't violate the rules, but they would violate UDAP. And as you know, Boris, UDAP is this big nebulous monster that can mean anything depending, it's open to a wide variety of interpretation, especially in examination. It's, you know, what, what could be a UDAP today might not be a UDAP tomorrow. So mm. I think creditors really have to pay attention to what the final rule says and how the CFPB is going to interpret those final rules for non-debt collectors. Got it, got it. And is that on the horizon or is that still sort of TBD or is that, is that, in other words, should we be holding out hope and waiting for this to occur? Uh, and in your opinion, when, when, if ever? Well, I, I think it is on the horizon. So um, about a year ago, the CFPB held a symposium, actually a very good symposium about how to better define UDAP. Mm. When, um, Mick Mulvaney and then ultimately Kathleen Craninger took over the Bureau, there was a lot of concern in industry about how to define UDAP. Dodd-Frank really doesn't define it. It defines it in a very kind of amorphous way. And industry has, has asked the Bureau to put more definition around UDAP. And so they had a whole symposium and they ultimately came out with some guidance that said that you know, they would look at UDAP a little bit differently. And then the NPR came out and kind of touched on UDAP. I do think, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later, I do think that the Bureau is going to try to put some frame, framework around UDAP. And if they do, whether they do or they don't, UDAP is an issue that any originator, fintechs, bank, whatever, must pay attention to and see how the Bureau is focusing on it. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's ongoing. Got it, got it. So that, that's, pretty, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I, I think that there's that linkage because, you know, we, we talk with a lot of clients and sometimes there isn't necessarily that linkage between the CFPB and the creditors or originators that, themselves uh, sort of uh, d directly. Um, but it seems like that, that's a, let's, somewhat of a closing gap just based on uh, what, what, you're, what you're indicating. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe a question now, more of a pragmatic or tactical question mm -hmm. for, some fo uh, for, for our viewers today. Okay, we know these rules are coming. Uh, we know that's on the horizon. It's not too far of a horizon uh, out there. And of course, uh, we'll, we'll have a post-cap live recap once the rules actually do come, come out and yes. we actually understand. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, but the question for you is what can people do today practically in their day-to-day -day business operation to prepare for this? Because um, obviously, I think, it, it, and remind me if I'm incorrect on this, but once the rules are, are, are you know, put forth, I think there's a, a period of time of when they are given a chance to be adopted. Is that a correct statement That's of correct. my part? And, and how long is that period? It's a year. It's a year okay. implement. It'll be a, the proposal is a year implementation period. Got it. But what can folks do today or start to think about today in preparation for this? Or what should they be doing? Right. Like really well, pra practically. Yeah. Well, let me say this. If you haven't thought about or read the NPR yet, or yeah. done anything internally yet uh, to prepare, you're a little late. <laughs> mm -hmm. We, as Boris, uh, through your team, we have we have uh, said to many of your clients, both in webinars and in writings, that really the preparation for the final rules started. 
the day after the NPR was published. I mean, that was when you really needed to get with your team, read it, understand and get an idea of what the Bureau was thinking about and really start to set a strategy, uh, assuming that everything in the NPR would, be, would, would come to fruition, how you were gonna set up for that. So um, that should have happened already. If you have not, <laughs> right. uh, what I would say is you need to pull out the NPR. And, and let me also remind folks that a couple months ago, uh, to the extent that um, you are collecting debt that might be out of stat, there were proposals regarding disclosures for out of stat debt. So they're all gonna, even though that was released after the NPR, the, the conventional wisdom is, is the NPR and the time bar debt disclosures are all gonna come out at the same time. So you need to pull both of those out after you listen to this webinar <laughs> and get your <laughs> compliance teams together and really, you need to sit down and read it, determine what aspects of the NPR would, would um, be relevant to your company and the, and the activities that you do. And you really need to think about from an infrastructure basis, what you would need to do to comply. So for example, you may be already emailing texting, and I hope that you are. And so you can compare with your policies and procedures today, what you would need to change should the rule come out uh, you know, once the rule does come out. So you can do somewhat of a comparison. Um, if you are sending, you know, you're gonna need to make determinations about what your forms are gonna look like. What is your, your validation notice? There's a big consideration for many folks about whether to send the validation notice um, electronically. And the rule does address that. I think it's a little complicated. It's not something that I'm recommending to clients right now. Um, but you, you really have to, uh, really dear colleague friend of mine says you really have to kind of look at the rule and get people in a room and read it like story time you have to literally get people in a room and read it out loud to everybody so that they clearly understand what it is that the rules say so um th that you should be doing that and if you you haven't put a team together within your compliance group i would do that i would have a point person or two in that team so that when issues do come up with implementation, it's it's not this mass, you know, Hail Mary e email, oh my God, what I do, what do I do when eight people are, are giving their comments? There should be, as I said, one or two point people who are in charge of making sure that the questions are going up and that the communication about how to comply are coming down in an organized fashion. Otherwise, you're all going to be running around crazy trying to figure out what to do. I mean, I would also say, um, not shameful of this, you really need to hire counsel. Um, if you haven't done so already, again, to go through these rules and look at what those implications will be. Um, there's gonna be a lot of trial and error, but as I said, it's, it's not something that you wanna start thinking about, um, you know, until it's too late. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great, great advice. And I think, uh, to your point, if you haven't done this already today, I, I think you, you need to go into a little bit of a speed mode. Yep. Let me ask you a little bit of a different question. Um, sure. As we look forward, Joanne, you know, let's say you've done all of the right things together uh, today, meaning you've reviewed the proposed uh, rules and you're, you've sort of prepared yourself organizationally um, from across different aspects, whether it's operational, legal compliance, and so on and so forth, and you've created an oversight committee what should people look beyond this? Like what's after the 30 days, beyond even the 12 months uh, of, of where the rules are, are going to sort of take place, what else is happening in between now and the next 12 months that people should have on their radar and they should be looking out for, in your opinion? You know, um, I think it's a really good question. Um, I think for our industry, look, it's been a very challenging six months. Yeah. Uh, not only uh, internally and having to move massive amounts of people to, to home offices, setting up a, an infrastructure of technology that maybe you didn't have, and then dealing with consumers. I mean, you're dealing with consumers now at a completely different level. Because remember, as much as everybody kind of is in the same boat right now. We're all sitting at home. If you've got kids, your kids are home. You've got to do homeschooling. Um, no one is in a better situation now during COVID. It was, it was certainly a leveling off period for folks. But I, 
I think some of the cues that I'm hearing from the Bureau and even from prudential regulators, standard regulators that, that do banks, it's all going to be about, as we're going to start to see, how you dealt with consumers during these past six months or longer. I mean, I don't know how long, you know, I don't know when we come out of this, but right. there's going to be a look back on that. I think for banks, it's going to be how did banks um, comply with the CARES Act? As you know, there were certain provisions. So if you had a mortgage, you were allowed to have a deferment or forbearance. Right. Did banks offer that? In the student loan servicing space, there was uh, and even student loan space, you know, did you offer, the, again, the deferment forbearance? There was credit, big, big credit reporting issues about how to report debts during COVID and accommodations. Um, and then how did you communicate with consumers? There's no playbook for this. You know, the exam manual doesn't anticipate your workers being at home. Uh, it doesn't anticipate the kind of... Um, situation that consumers are going to be in. So it is so important in these last six months to make sure that you've documented all these different circumstances and in dealing with consumers, um, because I think there's going to be a big look back. Well, you should have done it this, you know, a consumer called you and said they were going to be out of work for two months, yet you still demanded that they make their payment, or you didn't have a hardship, um, or you did a garnishment, uh, all these things that were just never anticipated come to, you know, when you started the, the year in January, nobody anticipated this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that you document all these exceptions that occurred um, these last six months. You have, you reviewed these exceptions. You have a good explanation for why they happened. Um, how you, there, how was their oversight for your, 300 call center people who were all sitting at home. How, how did you make sure they were doing their work? All of that's going to be looked at. And, and, and I know this not because, you know, I'm kind of looking into a crystal ball, but about two, three months ago, the Bureau sent out questionnaires to some of the larger market participants. And these are the exact questions that they asked. Um, so the, these are the areas that they're going to be focusing on. They can't supervise the, not, no, regulator right now can go through any kind of supervision examination because they can't go on site. So what the Bureau has said is we're going to do priority assessments. So they're going to take all those answers from uh, the questionnaires and they're going to look at them and then they're going to send out, you know, kind of paper remote type of supervisions and you're going to have to put your, your information together and that's how they're going to, to look at this. So it's really important if you haven't organized yourself uh, by what has happened in the last six months, you really need to do it now, especially if you're a larger organization. No, that's great. Uh, that, that's great. Great advice and great uh, foresight into, into that. And I think organizations should should you know sh should mm -hmm. get behind that. I think it's good for them. It's good for the consumer. So uh, right. from, from 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 that standpoint, what is? Let me ask you maybe a broader topic, Dren, uh, mm -hmm. with the impeding election sort of coming you know, by the time this gets released maybe in for potentially, you know, the next 30 days, what is the, what is the, your, in your opinion, the future for the CFPB just in, in general as well? Because that's been a little bit in flux from my understanding. Yeah. I don't, yeah. And I don't know what your take on that is. Well, I think it's going to be interesting. So um, as we, as you know, back at the beginning of the summer, uh, mm -hmm. end of June, the Supreme Court found that the structure of the CFPB having a, a, a one director that can only be removed for cause was an unconstitutional structure. Um, and that was a position that the CFPB initially opposed, but then they supported. They believed that they were unconstitutional. So as of this moment, um, the, the current director, Kathleen Kraninger, can be fired at will by the president. He doesn't need a reason. Um, if President Trump uh, is reelected, all, all indications are that she will continue to serve out her term. He has no reason to fire her. Uh, if uh, Biden is elected, then he now has that right. Um, there's been some debate of whether he'll do that. I, I, I have to believe that he will, based on the alliances that he has developed with the more progressive wing of the party. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's likely that if there is a Biden administration, um, Kathleen Kraninger will, will, will lose her position at the CFPB. So the question is who's going to replace her. 
It's not going to be someone like Kathleen Kraninger. And, and I will say this about her. I have found her to be, um, I think she's trying to be very middle of the road. I think mm -hmm. that she takes a lot of industry concerns to heart, which I think are, are good. But I also think she understands the mission of the CFPB, and that is to protect consumers. I, and That's you right. will see in the last couple months, enforcement has been through the roof. So she right. supports her enforcement team. But in, in a political position of what she is, sometimes being middle of the road doesn't serve you very well. It's, right. I, I think, uh, I agree with it, but it, it doesn't serve you well in Washington, that is for sure. So I think it's going to depend. You're going, you're going to get a much more aggressive regulator. Um, I have some ideas, but I won't throw out names. And I think you're, you're going to have somebody who's going to look to the prior, um, to, 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 you know, during the Cordray administration, some of the things that the Bureau did. So I think you're going to see heavy enforcement. Um, I do believe as much as the debt collection rule is going to come out, I think that rule could be in jeopardy with a change of administration. Mm -hmm. I think intentionally survive. I think the reason they want to put, they want to publish it in October is to hopefully survive what is called a Congressional Review Act challenge. Congress does have the ability to repeal any rule uh, from an agency by joint resolution of both members of the House. I don't think that, uh, given the makeup of Congress today and through the end of the year, they would be able to do that. So I think the rule would survive congressional review um, challenges. However, I think you need to look at what happened to the payday rule. Uh, the payday rule came out in 2017, there were legal challenges, and then in late 2018, 2019, Kathleen Kraninger made the decision, as she is permitted to do under her authority as director of the CFPB, she pulled the payday rule to do more review. Mm. She didn't feel that the ability to repay provisions had enough scientific support. She pulled it for about a year. Now, about a month ago, they reissued the payday rule and it did not have an ability to repay provision. It still had the payment provisions, but the ability to repay was, 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 was um, taken out and was omitted. And now it's a final, it's a final rule, which will be challenged. The same thing's going to, I think is going to happen with the debt collection rule. We know that consumer advocates do not like the call cap provision. They do not like the statute of limitations disclosures. Mm -hmm. They do not like the fact that email and text can be unlimited um, and not subject to a cap. So I really would not be surprised that if there is a new director at some point, that director before the implementation period, will pull that rule to say, we need to look at it again. So mm. I know we've talked about companies, um, com you know, look, doing an assessment, making sure they're prepared for the rule. Even if this happened, my advice to you is still get prepared for the rule. Because if anything, the proposed rule, as I call it, is a policy document and it's a standard for best practices. So you, you are not gonna be harmed if you follow what the CFPB already proposed. It cannot be that you were doing unfair practices if the CFPB has already said uh, th through its whole rulemaking process that th this is the kind of standards that we want. So you would be best served to continue to follow the NPR regardless of what a future director would do. Now, if, if the rule is changed, you can make slight adjustments. You know, okay, you can't do seven, but you can do six calls per week. Right, right. That, that's yeah. an easy thing, you know, they're, they're, right. they're not going to just blow up and say there is no more rules. Got that it. would really, I think politically, that would be a bad thing. It, we might, everybody agrees there needs to be rules around debt collection. What, the, what they are and how we nuance them, we can have that debate. So, but I do think that, that the rule runs a risk of that in a change of administration. No, that's, 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 uh, that's really great insight. Uh, and, and thank you for that. I mean, that was going to be my question in terms of, uh, of the rules and how they may change with a changing administration. Well, Joanne, this has been cer certainly educational and insightful uh, for me. Uh, I hope it was for our viewers today because uh, this is really, really important. It's important that they stay on top of it. So uh, on behalf of Livox and the team here, I wanted to thank you for coming on our podcast and sharing your knowledge with the listeners and viewers. Thank you again, Joanne. And I hope to be speaking with you in the near uh, future and hopefully in person.